Am I on? You are now. Hi. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Mike Ledger. I'm a, um, a retired geologist. I was a university lecturer and um, I've been asked to do a session this afternoon on um, dinosaurs and what films and so on tell us and whether they're, whether they're correct or not. I don't know how many people are watching, but um, I just give one shout out to, to one one scout that I know, which is um, Sam Willis in Biker. Um, he promised me that he would be watching. So at least if no one else is, I'm hoping to talk to one person. Right, I've got a mixture of PowerPoint and real um, dinosaur um, fossils around me. Switching backwards and forwards between the two has been a bit of a problem. So we'll give it a go, OK? You'll have to hang on with me. And if it goes wrong, just whistle, right? OK, so I'm going to have to switch to um, PowerPoint. Where are we? Come on. Right, so this is about um, dinosaurs. The, um, the dinosaur head behind the picture actually is a Tyrannosaurus rex, a T-Rex known as Black Beauty. It's in um, a museum in Canada called the Royal Tyrell Museum. It's one of the best preserved T-Rexes in the world. Now, what do we know? Oh no, are you not gonna work now? Come on, oh, there are, right. Start with, how do we know about dinosaurs? Where did we find them? Well, this here, this beach here is down in Dorset. And some of you may have heard about someone called Mary Anning. Well, these are the cliffs that Mary Anning found um, the majority of her fossils in. Um, she found the first one, the world's first ichthyosaur, plesiosaur and pterosaur. First one was in 1811. What did it look like? Well, that's um, a plesiosaur in the um, Natural History Museum in London. And my daughter looking very, very unamused being standing there for scale. Um, and these things were amazing. Look at that head, okay? The, 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 when they were found, um, the Victorians were horrified, horrified by these weird, weird animals. And um, you can understand that. You've never seen anything like that before in your life. Um, that's what that's an artist's impression, what they think they look like. They actually look a, sort of a bit like dolphins. Um, what, what else? We've got the other ones that she found, which is the first plesiosaur in um, 1823. This is um, one of the swimming long necks with Anne standing next to it for scale. And these things horrendous size. Okay, the longest um, plesiosaur is about 14 meters long. And that's what we think they look like. Now that's okay, but how do we know that? Oh, no, that's right. I'm going to say this thing here and just to give you, I decided to do it in blocks because it was easier. This is um, a Shastasaurus in the Royal Tyrell Museum. And um, I put that on purely because we're talking about Jurassic Park and Jurassic World. And I thought I'd include this one. You can see the layout of the bones that they've got and the outline of the animal underneath. And this thing is, um, let me just check on the details of it, 21 meters long. OK, lived in the Triassic period about 2000, uh, 210 million years ago and is about 30 percent bigger than anything else swimming in the sea at the time. Interestingly, we have in um, Jurassic World, we had um, the Megalodon. Well, the Megalodon actually is smaller than that. This is only four metres short of the size of a blue whale. OK, let's go on a bit. How do we know this? Because we can find their fossils, we can find their bones. And um, these are all, all um, fossils from Dorset and from, um, from uh, North Yorkshire. And can you see in the bottom left hand corner the bone um, in cross section? I'll show you the real one in a minute when we come back on live screen. But can you see, you can actually, the, the, the detail of the interior of the bone is, um, is preserved. So sometimes we get immense detail, which helps us um, to uh, to understand what's going on. Now, let's see if I can get back to Teams and be live. And are we? I've gone. I've gone completely. Oh, there I am. Right. OK, so um, just to show you what these things look like that there. OK, is um, a collection of fossils together 
in one block. You have backbones, you have bits of rib and so on. And this is the one that has the um, has the detail in it. You know, sometimes you find them as, oh, there you are, where are you there, right? Locked together, tailbones, or little tailbones locked together. So we can see how, no, we can collect them individually. These come from, um, from the beach. Now that's a, an ichthyosaur backbone. And can you see on that, um, there are t lumps on the side, which you saw in the picture, and that's where the um, the ribs attached. I mean, they get quite large. I and mean, that's that's one one interesting bone, right? And actually, you can pick these off the beach. You just find them on the beach. Those are ichthyosaur bones. That's a, a plesiosaur bone. Okay, you see, it's a quite quite a different shape. So we can find their bones. OK, we can find their skeletons. We can find the bones locked together. We can reconstruct what's going on to tell us what they look like, how big they were. And, and therefore work from that, how they moved. Let me go back to the PowerPoint. OK, so. We can also find their teeth. That's a Spinosaur. I'm going to show you one a Spinosaur tooth in a minute and um, a Triceratops. Come back out and we're in. OK, and to give you an idea, um, that's that's a Spinosaur tooth. Uh, there, OK, they're actually quite big. And the interesting thing about them is that they are they're round topped. Where are you? There you are. Where are you? <laughs> this is really difficult. OK, and that's because they're fish eaters. Um, Triceratops being a plant eater, one of the things that's interesting with those, and these are really small, so I do apologize. That's a triceratops tooth. Considering how big the animal is, that's a tiny little tooth. And the reason for that is because they wear their teeth down so quickly. Give you an idea of comparison. This is a copy, um, but that there, that's a T-Rex tooth. Much, much bigger. OK, so the teeth can show us um, what sort of food they eat. Um, now there's a there's a, a meat eater tooth. Right, you can see how different the shape is to say um, to that. Right, Oops, there we are. OK, so the teeth give us their, um, their mode of operation, if you like, as well as the bones. What, can, what else can we do? We can go back. Hang on, so I'm going to have to go back again. OK, and um, we can then try and work out what they look like. These, this here is in um, Crystal Palace down in, in South London. OK, and this, these are the first attempts by anybody to, to, to try and show what dinosaur, the first dinosaurs look like. First dinosaurs found in the world were found um, in this country, the first bones actually and teeth were found um, down in West Sussex. So this was a, um, a, a life size reconstruction um, in Crystal Palace Park. And basically they look like giant lizards. Or, um, or they don't. OK, this is a, a more realistic one. This is from Jurassic Park, which was what we're talking about. And these are the, the famous um, Velociraptors from Jurassic Park. Now in Jurassic Park, they're quite interesting. They're about my height, okay, and they're hunter killers and they work together. And they look like, um, well, they look scaly and leathery. But is that true? Is that actually true? because that's that's what most people's perception of a velociraptor looks like. In fact, actually, if you look at a velociraptor, that's its fossil, that's its skeleton, right? And it's it's only um, about about a foot and a half, well, that's just over, um, just over half a meter high and about one and a half meters long. Like you can see on its claws, the killer claws that exist, and, and those things really are vicious, right? But actually, 
is the Jurassic Park image a velociraptor right? And the answer actually is no, because what people think it looks like is that, which is quite different. It's got feathers. It looks, I always refer to velociraptors as turkeys with attitude. It's the size of a turkey. And that is, is staggering. Now, I can understand why they make velociraptors in the film six foot tall and really vicious, and they are vicious, because I don't think that would have the same effect in the film, having something like nasty turkeys running around chasing people. So we actually get quite an unusual um, perception from, from films and often believe them. OK, back in the room. Am I back here? Yes, I am. OK, right. What I want to do then is think about what else do we know and what else can we can we see that, that may or may not be true? OK, velociraptors clearly are and every reconstruction, every diagram, every drawing of a velociraptor since before Jurassic Park was released is covered in feathers. OK, but that doesn't matter. This is why when Jurassic Park and, and, and its subsequent follow up films came out, paleontologists, people who study fossils, were up in arms about misleading the public about what they look like. I'm just going to go back to the PowerPoint. OK, right. Now, Dippy from the Natural History Museum has been on tour around the country. And you might have seen her, um, the famous Diplodocus um, from the Natural History Museum. And again, now when I was young, which is a long time ago, I remember going up um, to the Natural History Museum and seeing Dippy. And when I went up there, when I was a, was a kid, um, she used to sit like a giraffe with her head up and her tail on the ground. But now you always see these these um, dinosaurs with their necks out stretched out in front of them, their tails out behind. Why? And that's because now with the advancement of science and the advancement of technology and tech um, and mechanics and understanding, we can see that actually the, the neck isn't flexible enough for it to lift its head up to a high angle. And so the tail is it acts as, acts as a counterbalance. Right. The other thing that's interesting with Dippy, and again, you know, her and her cousins appear in the films, is that um, that's a, a, a drawing of what they think Dippy looks like. And I don't know about you, but that does she doesn't look scaly at all. She looks almost furry. And again, that's because when they found skin patterns for dinosaurs um, of her her uh, her type, they found that actually well, she was probably covered in very, very fine feathers that made her look not quite fluffy, but furry. OK, but again, you know, in depiction in, in films, you wouldn't have it wouldn't be the same with a fluffy dippy. <laughs> it probably would because they're always um, always portrayed as being nice and and friendly and so on. Right. What else do we know about these things? Let's come back into it. Right. We have Dippy, but how big is Dippy? Dippy is enormous. Um, I'll give you an idea of how big she is because I'm going to come back to her in a little while. Right. Um, <laughs> this is something I made a while ago um, that I take in schools. So that is a full sized replica, if you like, made out of a carpet tile of her back footprint. I mean, that is huge. Interestingly, her front footprint is significantly smaller. Right. OK, these are big, big animals. I think I seem to remember reading that uh, the weight of a Diplodocus is about 10 times an elephant. OK, so we have Dippy. What else do we have? Let's go back to PowerPoint. Go back to T-Rex, because T-Rex is always famous. Um, there's around 50, 50 complete or nearly complete T-Rex skeletons in the world, so we know quite a lot of information about them. Um, 
Yeah, they are they are being portrayed as hunter killers. They've been portrayed as being able to run really fast. OK, and the, the interesting thing with science and particularly with paleontology is that the more we find, the more we can question what's going on. Even it was last week or the week before an article came out that, that now reckons looking at the mechanics of, of um, a T-Rex and its proportions and its weight, that actually it wasn't a runner at all. It's described as a very good long distance walker. There was questions a long t over the last few years in particular about being a hunter killer. And it probably wasn't a hunter killer either. It was a scavenger. And given its, its ferocious size, and those teeth are enormous, OK? Yeah, anything that was sickly, it could have. Anything bought by someone else, bought down by someone else, it could have for dinner. So it's not a running hunter killer at all. OK, so again, these these perceptions are different. Right. How do we know all this stuff? I want to take you over to Canada um, to again, back to the Royal Tyrell Museum that I was talking about earlier on. These are the Badlands near Drumheller, which is where the Royal Tyrell Museum is. And this is where they find a lot of the dinosaurs. When they find them, what do they do? Well, they really, really carefully excavate them and then wrap them in effectively plaster of Paris like you used to in the old days with them with broken bones and take them back to the workshop. This is the workshop shop at, um, at Drumheller at the Royal Tyrell Museum. And then they start to, to very, very delicately take them apart and clean them. OK, the reason I'm showing this is when we went out there, we were lucky to be shown around the, the workshop and how they prepare um, dinosaurs for exhibition, for study and exhibition. Um, it really is a labour of love. To give you an idea, this here is part of a, um, a dinosaur. And the, the interesting thing with this is that they're using metal um, grinding tools to grind away the rock, which you can see. But can you see it? I wasn't allowed to take a picture any closer up than that, but that is the skin pattern of a dinosaur. In, in immense detail, OK? Now, I wasn't allowed to take that because I took it about seven years ago and they reckoned it was going to take five years to uncover all the skin of this dinosaur, but they reckoned they'd got the entire, almost the entire dinosaur. And fortunately, I haven't been out there to see it again, but now they've uncovered it and it looks like that. That was five to six years work day after day after day to uncover that. And the detail in the skin pattern is, in, is incredible. And that's what gives us our information about what dinosaurs look like. On some dinosaurs, they can find, they can find chemical signatures which tell us what colours they were. So we can only not only not only just see what they how they looked, but we're beginning to figure out what colours or probably what colours they were. Right. The other thing we can find, which is what I wanted to come on to more than anything, is we can find um, dinosaur footprints. Now, in this country, we're actually very well off for dinosaur footprints. Um, we find them on the south coast and we find them on the northeast coast find them on the Isle of Wight and so on. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of pictures to start with, just to show you an idea of what you can find. That there, this is a place called St George in Utah. And St George in Utah is incredible because um, it's called Johnson's Farm. And Johnson's Farm, the, the landowner farmer, was clearing some land and discovered this, which is a rock platform. As he was excavating down to clear the land, he discovered this rock platform covered in over a thousand dinosaur footprints, realised how important this was and working with the, the state and the, the national authorities, turned it into a museum to preserve them. Um, obviously, <laughs> you know, a replica dinosaur looking there, but you can see that some of the, the, the footprints laid out on it. And it was this, these dinosaurs were walking across the edge of a, of a lake, a freshwater lake. So we can find their footprints. What else can we find? We can find behaviour. We can find this, for instance. And I don't know if you can read that or not, 
But that's that's on the edge of the, the lake, or what would have been the edge of the lake at that time. And that's that's a dinosaur swimming. So those are scratch marks made. It's upside down because obviously the, the, the scratch marks will be into the ground. So this is effectively the top cover lifted off. But those are scratch marks of a dinosaur swimming. So we know dinos those dinosaurs could swim. What else can we find out? We find this um, on the left hand side is a what's called a Eubrontes footprint. I'll talk about that in a minute. OK, but you can see that there's a mark from it dragging its tail. So they did drag their tails. There's also um, a, a, a picture which I didn't include where you can see that the, the a dinosaur sat down. So you can see the the, um, the imprint of its pelvis. So the, these things, they're not the bones, but they tell us how the dinosaur lived, how it moved. We can see its stride pattern. We can see how it walked. OK. Um, this is um, is what they think an Iguanodon looked like. As I said right at the beginning, Iguanodon was the first dinosaur discovered. Iguanodon means Iguana tooth. And these are um, some of the, um, the, 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 the most of the di a lot of the dinosaurs we find in this country are Iguanodons. OK. Um, that's Iguanodon at the um, Natural History Museum with Anne in front of it for scale. And again, I'll show you some of these in a minute when we come back live. But that is a big, big animal. That's um, the bottom left hand side. If you remember from Crystal Palace, that was the Iguanodon because that was the first one we found. OK, can you see that it's got um, a point on its nose, a bit like a rhino? And that was a misconception. I'll show you a copy of that in, in a minute when we come back live. But because it's made of matted hair, like a rhino's horn, they decided that's where it would be. And once they started to find other fossils, the top left hand picture shows that actually it's its thumb. So its thumb, its fingers were made out of bones, but its thumb was made out of matted hair. So the more we find, the more we can reconstruct and refine what we know about these animals. Um, right, let me let me pull back from that in a minute. Let's just check. Yes, right. I want to come back live for a minute. I will, when I do this in schools or in clubs, I usually work backwards and forwards between the two sets. So I can project onto the screen the pictures and then then everybody gets to look at and handle all the fossils with this system. I can't do that. So it's a bit difficult. But to give you an idea, that's a, again a copy of an Iguanodon thumb. And it has I don't think don't know whether you can see that has a little ridge in it, a little groove in it rather. OK. And, and I think I remember reading that that groove was so that it, if it was attacked, it would stab someone with its thumb and poison them. Iguana was a plant eater, so it's got to have some defense mechanisms. Um, what else do we know? Well, first of all, let's go back to um, the St. George ones. And aha, there it is. Right. Um, that there and I've outlined it in chalk because um, you can see it, see it when you handle it, but it's not easy. That is a Eubrontis footprint. That's the size of the footprints that were on the um, on that rock platform. You know, the one that was with the, the tail drag on it. That's a fairly big footprint. OK. They, other ones associated with it are called Grelata footprints. Um, and that's a Grelator footprint. That's from France. Oops. Right. And actually, you can see the markings, the pad markings um, of the foot on that. Right. Why are they called your Brontes and Grelator footprints? It's an interesting question, and I'm glad you asked that. It's because very rarely do you find evidence of the dinosaur that made the footprints. 
there's not many times I don't think where you'd find a set of footprints and the dinosaur dead at the other end of them. And so what they tend to have to do is they can they can figure out roughly which dinosaurs made the footprints by the shapes of the patterns of their feet, because that corresponds with the bone patterns of the fossils they find. But you can't necessarily guarantee that. And so they give the footprints their own name because they're called something called trace fossils. So the bigger ones are called Eubrontes and the smaller ones, the Grillators, um, are a separate group. Now there's a fair chance that the Grillator one was, was made by um, something like a Coelophysis. Okay, now Coelophysis footprint would be about that big. Okay, I talked about um, Velociraptor to give you an idea of how big a Velociraptor footprint is, because that's how big you would think it was. It actually is that big. That's a Velociraptor footprint. It's tiny. Hence me calling them um, you know, turkeys with attitude. That is a tiny footprint. Does that make sense? Right, what else can we find? I'm gonna nip back to a PowerPoint just to show you a few more pictures and then we'll come back in again. Right, down on the Isle of Wight, we can find, um, we can find footprints, okay? And um, these are Iguanodon footprints. That's, that's one of my boys, size 13 trainer on top of it. These things are huge. That there is just a collection of some of their footprints together and the little red circles, this is looking from the cliff down onto the beach because they're laying on the beach, um, is all the footprints. Now they are obviously not in situ. They're upside down because they're, um, they're, 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 they're fill it, they were filling in the footprints, right? And there's no pattern to those because they've just fallen out of the cliffs. But we do find them and we find them enormously. OK, I'm just going to come back out again. You're, I hope you're being you're patiently hanging on with me doing this. OK, right. That's an Iguanodon footprint. Again, that's quite that's a small one. I've got a copy of one in store which I couldn't get out because it's too big to pick up and hold up in front of a screen. But it's about twice, if not three times the size of that. It's a copy, this is a real one. Okay. Um, yeah, even smaller, you know, these things, you can see the toe prints on these. And this is for Hastings down on the south coast as is a smaller one still like that, Hastings, right? Um, they're really, really, really important. They tell us what's going on. This is part of a footprint. Oh dear. This is part of a footprint, again, um, of a theropod from, the, from Dorset. And again, you can see the, the outline of the toes. I've outlined them again in, um, in chalk because um, it's easy to see them live. It's not so easy to see them on screen, I discovered. Fine, we can find footprints. But what does that really tell us? This is um, a, co a place called Copper Ridge in Utah in America with my wife and patiently wandering out around as usual and um, supporting me and, and pointing things out. Can you see the dents in the ground behind her? You see, there are big ones and smaller ones. If you look down to the left hand side, are we doing on time? Yep, all right. If you look down to the left hand side, you can see there's a whole series of really big dents in the ground. Can you see between the, the bottom two, there are smaller ones as well? OK, what made those that what? Yeah. The smaller ones are made by an allosaur. 
Now this is a hunter killer. The bigger ones are probably, there are three different di dinosaurs that could have made them, one of which actually is Diplodocus, which is good because we have that um, to show you, right? But this is an Allosaur and a Diplodocus living at the same time. That's the Allosaur footprint. Again, with Anne's boot by the side of it to give you scale, we put water in it to make it stand out. Perfect footprint. OK, um, we, is it going to work? There are two Allosaur footprints and two Diplodocus footprints. Wonderfully preserved. Come on, come back. Right, let me come back into there. OK, let's just do that then. So what we have on there is we have Diplodocus, which we saw earlier on. Hang on. Just a second, the battery's running out. And that's it. All right now. OK, we're on. Right, so we have Diplodocus, which is that. OK, and we have Velo um, um, Allosaur, which is that. So this is either chasing or following that on that rock platform. Now, to me, that is phenomenal. I just, I could not believe that I saw that for real. Right, we have a meat eater chasing a giant plant eater. The other thing that it tells us is how they walk. If you again, if you were to see the footprints, they're primarily that. And the reason is that as they walk. They overlap their footprints, so the foot, foot, front foot goes down first and their stride pattern means that the back footprint almost invariably overlaps. The front foot, so if you find the two together, they're like that. And generally you tend to lose that so you only see the back footprint so it tells us how it walks the other thing that's that um, the researchers that have looked into that have discovered is that actually the stride pattern on those those footprints as they go round of the diplodocus is that it's not walking evenly it's various varying its footprints um its stride pattern and they think that's because it obviously it had a limp of some sort it may have had an injury. We don't know because obviously didn't, you know, the, the bones aren't there, the fossils aren't there, but the, the trace fossils, the footprints are, and they tell us that it wasn't walking properly. Could it be that the Allosaur had already attacked it and was following it? Could it be, this is purely some, uh, you know, um, an idea, could it be that having attacked it, it was going to follow it until it got weak enough that he could finish it off for dinner. Because in reality, Diplodocus was so big that it had no known natural enemies. Nothing could take it down. They reckon that, that if a Diplodocus hit something like a T-Rex with its tail, it would kill it. But an injured one could be food. So, the, so we find these details in in their in their in the trace fossils in their footprints not just in their live fossils you know if you like if you like in the bones and the teeth and everything else what i didn't say was st george i said showed you pictures of them um, of the, the swimming uh, marks there are also pad marks and skin marks skin marks on on the ground so we get ideas of what the what the animals look like um you know for skin pattern as well. Right, what have I got left to show you? I want to show you um, a couple more pictures and then I'm going to show you a few more fossils if that's okay. This here is um, is a rock on the beach. Well, it was on the beach, it's probably been taken away to a museum now, um, at Whitby. Um, the lens cap is the standard lens cap, so it gives you an idea. And I've outlined them in red because it's easy to see. But those are um, a, a sauropod footprint. And again, it shows you what I was talking about. The small, small front foot overlaid by a back foot. Yeah. 
So we find those for real. There's, um, there's a whole section of sauropod footprints down on the Dorset coast, um, which I haven't got pictures of, which I must do next time I'm down there. OK, this again, almost adjacent to that last block of rock at Whitby is this. And can you see on the, the right hand side of it, scratch marks? Those are exactly the same as the, as the scratch marks at St George, and that is a swimming dinosaur. Come back in again. Okay, now these are small, so I'll ha you'll have to be patient with me um, if I can hold it up. Right, can you see that? Those are the scratch, those are scratch marks from Whitby of a swimming dinosaur. Those are the those are the same marks as the, as they were in the picture. Yeah, they're very small. Not all dinosaurs are large. In fact, mo the majority of dinosaurs were fairly small. You also find down that way, and again, I've outlined it in um, in white. But this this is a a little theropod, little um, theropod um, fossil on a lump of rock from Whitby. And I found that just sitting on the beach. In fact, I like my stories. I still got a couple of minutes left. Um, I was helping to lead a field trip down there from the university and we were looking at these and the, and the sequence of rocks in the cliff. And Bill Scott, who was leading it, and Andy Lane, um, I said, right, I'm going to go off and have a look for footprints, see if I can find any. And I couldn't find any because the pictures I take that I just showed you were the year before. And I sat down really fed up and took my rucksack off and poured myself a cup of coffee in the flask and put my flask on top of that rock. And then only then realised there was a footprint on it. Always keep your eyes open. What else can we find? Again, in the same area in North Yorkshire, are these, right? That is dinosaur munchies. Okay, that's that's the big, the giant. If it sort of looked like canes, giant canes that the that the plant eaters were eating, you can find their food. If you can find their food, you can also find their poo. <laughs> okay, dinosaur poo. And all of these help us fill in the stories of the dinosaurs that give us the background understanding, if you like, of how they lived, where they lived, what the conditions were. If we go back just to um, to this one, the, the Whitby one there, you can't see it, but in it there's little black flecks. flecks. Can you see there's one? Where is it? It's there. OK. That's fossilised plant material. OK, so we can find the things associated with them to find what the environment was like. We know the St George one, they were living on the side of a freshwater lake because they find freshwater fish fossils in there. OK, does that sort of make sense? Um, I think I was told half an hour ish and that's that's 35 minutes. Um, is that OK? Uh, how do I know if anybody's responding? That's great, great. Thank you, mate. Um, Is that all right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, We've got a couple of questions, if you don't mind, on. just I came in by the Q&A. Yep. Um, we'll just read out a couple of questions and then we'll send you the full list of them. Um, <laughs> there's, there's 46 and they're still coming in at a rapid really? rate. Really? Oh, good. Yeah, loads of questions. <laughs> um, one of, I may not know the answers to some of them. Go on. What, one of the questions are, what is the closest modern day relative to the dinosaur? The closest um, birds. Birds are one of the interesting things about dinosaurs and, and, and people have said this. I've heard this said to me quite a lot in the past is, of course, well, crocodiles are, are, are living dinosaurs and they're not. Um, Richard Owen, who defined what a dinosaur was, dinosaur meaning terrible lizard, defined that a dinosaur stands upright like us. 
Um, now that might sound a bit weird, but but actually what it means is that its hips and its shoulders, if you like, equivalent to us, mean that its legs sit. Un How can I do this? Sit underneath it, it, underneath them like us. Whereas if you think about it, a, 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 um, a crocodile walks like that, dragging its stomach on the ground or lifting up, right? But dinosaurs, the the design of their hips, where they're they're um, called lizard hips or bird hips. Their legs are underneath them. So that rules out, um, if you like, um, other ones. The other problem is that dinosaurs, by definition of Richard Owen, OK, who said it, I think it was in 1842, I think it was, he said that, is that dinosaurs only lived on the land. So the ichthyosaurs and the plesiosaurs, the mosasaurs, OK, all living in the sea aren't dinosaurs. They're reptilian um, um, cousins, if you like, and the pterosaurs in the air are flying, so they're not dinosaurs. So, so to some extent, you know, even birds aren't quite dinosaurs. Now, it might be that we need to somehow um, redefine what a dinosaur is, but does that sort of answer it? Is that OK? Um, I believe so. Logan, who asked the question, I'm sure will know if it's if it uh, answered his question or not. Um, another question is, could dinosaurs return to Earth? Uh, that's one of the worst, worst things to come out of, of um, Jurassic Park and the films. Um, they couldn't come naturally. Um, they're talk, they're, there's talk about, and it's not dinosaurs, it's, it's later than that, OK? Um, but they, 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 they it's, it's this idea of having and finding DNA. My screen's just gone blank. Are you OK? Are you still got me? Yeah, we've still got you. Have you can, can you see me? I can't see anything apart from. Yeah, I, I, I can see you. You are still there. You can. All yeah. right. OK. Hang on. Let's. Um, yeah, no, I've, I've gone. I've lost completely at this end. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I'll just talk. Um, of woolly mammoths being brought back to life and there's there's a possibility that because they 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 post date the dinosaurs by a, a lot and that's because there are um frozen mammoths that have been found up in siberia in russia and they found partial dna but even then what they what they're talking about from what i've read is that they will splice together um elephant dna and woolly mammoth dna so even that won't produce um, uh, uh, if you like, a pucker, a real mammoth. There's no way we find anything, any, any DNA for dinosaurs. And I know every so often it comes up in the press. In fact, over the last couple of weeks, there's been quite a lot of stuff in the press about dinosaurs. But realistically, no, I don't think so. No, we could probably fabricate one, but then that's not a real dinosaur. OK. Um, a question from Freya is, what is your favourite dinosaur? My favourite dinosaur? Oh, that's, do you know, I've never really thought about that. Um, I, I think, do you know, I don't know. I think Iguanodon, purely because because they're, they're, they're the first ones that were found and we have we, we find a lot of them in this country. Um, it's fascinating finding the raptor footprints that I photographed all over the place. It's, it's absolutely amazing. But um, just just to yeah, just to see the first ones, I think is brilliant. Excellent. Yeah. Um, cool. Has there ever been a larger fossil found here in Northumberland? Um, and, and if so, what? what animal or not animal kind of what 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 part of the dinosaur family did that fossil well it's family? interesting because depending you know, we we won't find any in northumberland um because the the dinosaurs only lived during the triassic jurassic and cretaceous period so from about 145 million years ago up to no about 200 about 200 million years ago up to 65 when they when they were wiped out and, and all the rocks in Northumberland are older than that. 
So the dinosaurs lived in the Triassic, Jurassic and Cretaceous. Below the Triassic, you've got the Permian. And below that, you've got the Carboniferous and virtually all rock in Northumberland is Carboniferous. So we're way, way down. Having said that, um, at Howick Bay on the Northumberland coast, there's a rock platform there that is supposed to have um, dinosaur-like tracks on it. Now, I've read articles on this and been there so many times, and even with the eye of faith, I can't see footprints there. But they are way, way down before the dinosaurs, so no, we won't find any. The nearest you're going to go to is somewhere like Whitby, Scarborough. I mean, I've got footprints from Scarborough as well, but I haven't got those in here at the moment, um, because those are Jurassic rocks. Sorry, we haven't got any. We'll have to look for other stuff. <laughs> Um, that's, yeah. that's great, thank you. So I think last question then is why does the T-Rex have such small arms compared to the rest of their body? <laughs> I, <coughs> I've asked that in fact, I've got my, my geology t-shirt on which you know, um, what does it keep calm, ask, let the geologist handle it. I nearly put on my T-Rex t-shirt which is a T-Rex trying to scratch its nose saying I've got an itchy nose. Um, I've asked that for a lot of people for a lot of time and about, oh, let me think, it must have been about September, October last year, I read an article that, that said that because they, they, they found, a, and a lot of fossils are coming out of China in particular, really good ones, um, but it appears that they found some juvenile T-Rexes and it appears that, now don't, this could change, that as the T-Rex grew up, its front legs stopped growing. So what you, as I read it, what you've got is a fully grown adult T-Rex with a child's arms because the arms didn't then evolve and grow with the rest of the animal. And what's interesting is the fact that, that actually, having looked at the ones at, at Tyrell and other places, Tyrell Museum, there's no way that, that a, a T-Rex's front arms could be used for anything. It couldn't, it can't reach its mouth. It couldn't, if it did have an itchy nose, it couldn't possibly um, um, scratch it. And I did read something, and I'm not convinced by this, but there was something that I read um, a, about a year and a half ago that they reckoned, looking at the mechanics of it, that if a T-Rex fell over or got knocked over, because its arms, front arms are so useless, it couldn't get back up again. But, but the, the beauty of, of all of all of geology in particular and, and paleontology is that the more we find, the more we understand, the more questions we have. Is that all right? <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Um, yep. What I'm going to do, Mike, is I'll kind of download all of the questions yep. and I'll send them across to you to answer them because they are still coming in at, a, <laughs> at, a, at an astonishing rate. <laughs> Well, thank you for everybody watching me then. Um, thank you for being patient with the technology. We've never done this before. I have never performed in front of a camera before. I've only ever done this live. And, and I can then judge by the reaction of people that I'm doing it with as to what they're understanding, what they are and change it. And so I'm, I'm working blind on what you're all seeing. And um, thank you for being patient. One last thing, right? look for fossils. The, the, the thing that even after 40 years, is it now? Yeah, about must be 40 years of, of being a geologist. The thing that, that still gives me a thrill, and it might sound really sad to a lot of people, is when you find a fossil for the first time, when you dig it out, out of a rock, and, and actually you're the first person, the first living thing to see that animal since it died. And it might be 300 million years old, 400 million years old, 500 million years old, and nothing has seen that until you saw it for the first time. And I think, I still think that's incredible. I still think that's amazing. Thank you for listening. Enjoy the rest of camp. Bye. <laughs>